All right, well, welcome, everybody. How's everyone doing this morning? Excellent, excellent. Um, my name is Thaddeus uh, Paskert, and I work in the Office of College Aid here at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm also joined uh, by our director, Mr. James Heller, who's going to be back in in a moment. He's helping some families out front. And then uh, Phyllis Franks and Lisa Crandall from the Bursar's office, who will be uh, picking up the second part of the presentation. Uh, so we're here today to talk about financial matters. Uh, that includes uh, both our college aid office as well as uh, the Bursar's office. So, so just to get things started, um, this is our college aid website. Uh, most of the websites on campus are always the office.uchicago.edu. Um, our office is located in Walker Hall. Uh, it's the building that's next to uh, Rosenwald. So if you know where the admissions office is, it's the building uh, immediately uh, to the left of that if you're looking out in front. Um, we're located in Suite 309, so we're on the third floor. So if you or your students ever have any questions, uh, please feel free to come visit us. Uh, we do not have uh, dedicated appointments. If you want to set one up, that's fine. But we do have open walk-in hours, so you're more than welcome to come in whenever you like. Uh, we're open from 8.30 until 5, uh, and can see students and families during that time. So if you have any specific questions, anything you need you want to go over in person, please do feel free uh, to come on and, and visit us. Uh, additionally, our website is also a very good resource. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information on there about the aid process, uh, answers to questions you might have, uh, and then important information. So let's start with our college's uh, aid office's mission. Uh, our mission is no barriers, meaning that there should not be any barrier between applying to UChicago, getting financial aid, and being successful while you're at the institution. Uh, the No Barriers program has been running about two two or so years, this is the third year going into it. And what that means is that we don't have any kind of loan expectation when we're making an aid determination. Uh, other institutions may factor loans in when they're doing an initial need calculation. We do not do that. Uh, we want to make sure that students are not uh, held down by debt, so we do not factor that in. Um, in addition to that, it's also kind of coupled with the Odyssey Scholarship Program. Uh, for those that might not be aware, around 10 years ago, a anonymous donor to the institution who we only know was an alumni, donated $100 million to UChicago uh, for needy students. So we've been uh, making use of that over the last decade to help students finance their education. Um, our office's primary services, obviously uh, processing of federal and state aid, uh, as well as institutional aid, which is the big uh, majority of our awards going out to students. Um, application assistance, so if, if you or the students are working on their institutional aid application, the federal aid application, if you're running into any issues or have questions, we'll help out with that. And then also special circumstances review, which we'll touch on a little bit more later on. Uh, so if there's extenuating circumstances, thing that may impact your overall uh, ability to pay or what you might get in the way of financial aid, uh, we can take a look at those things. And then of course, assisting with just general questions, everything from how to complete uh, the FAFSA application to if you do have loan questions, uh, how your aid's dispersed, uh, when it's going to go on, things of that nature. So again, I talked about no barriers a little bit. Um, if any of you applied to the institution and indi indicated that you were interested in receiving financial aid, there was no application fee, so that did waive that out. Um, the opportunities uh, that students uh, are made available with the no barriers program, um, internships, externships, career counseling, career advice. There's a large variety of things that are made available to you Chicago students outside of just their regular financial aid. Um, I would often like to say you're not just paying for a you know, world-class education here at UChicago, but also the benefits that come with it, as well as access to the alumni network after you graduate, which is, of course, massive and, and uh, very well established. Uh, and then, of course, the lifelong career support. So we do have a career services center that students can visit. Um, they're going to be required to visit, I believe, actually, now that they're in their first year. And uh, they continue through uh, visiting that Career Services Center during their four years while they're here at UChicago. Um, they do all kinds of professional development, uh, everything from resume writing to practice interviews, things of that nature, and as well as helping uh, you know, students find opportunities even after they graduated. And a lot of the uh, other uh, benefits uh, that come with being a UChicago student extends well past their graduation. So when students are alumni of the institution, they can still come back, talk to the Career Advising se uh, Center, uh, you know, make use of things through the alumni office. So don't just think that once your student graduates after four years that they're done. They have a lifelong connection to this institution, and we encourage them, to, of course, to make use of that. So college aid, 
award, the actual award that your student re is receiving, how do we calculate what that award is? Well, we take their student's cost of attendance, which how many people in here know what this year's cost of attendance is? We got some hands. Okay, so it's, I heard 70, 75. It's around $75,000 for this year, which can seem like a very large daunting number, but we in the College Aid Office want to help cover as much, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah we, we, we know, which we want to help cover as much, if not all of that, if we can. So the way that we determine the cost of attendance is it includes two kinds of costs, direct costs and indirect costs. A direct cost is something that the student has to pay to the institution. So things like tuition, fees, room and board when they're living on campus. But we also factor in indirect costs, which can include things like books, supplies, personal and miscellaneous expenses. Those two things together build that $75,000 cost. Um, the family contribution, that's calculated be using both via the FAFSA application, the free application for federal student aid that you and your students have likely completed, as well as our institutional aid application. Um, the other things that can contribute towards that uh, cost of attendance also is a work expectation, which we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So this is the cost of attendance for 2017-2018. Uh, there's the tuition, student life, and UPASS, and class fee, and room and board. Those are all the direct costs, things that students have to pay to the institution directly. A very quick note about the, uh, the class fee, the, the 1209 class fee, that is only billable in their first year. Uh, that is mainly to take care of the operational administration costs associated with the orientation that your students are currently going through. Um, initially, I believe it might have been billed all up front, but now that's spread across all three quarters to kind of make it a little bit um, you know, easier to deal with and so that the a billable amount's the same per, uh, per quarter. But that's something that they'll only really see their first year. Um, Obviously, the books and supplies and personal expenses are not necessarily directly billed to the institution, so those are things that either could be covered by aid overages or directly out of pocket by the student. So how we determine the award is we take that cost of attendance, those direct and indirect costs, subtract out the parent contribution and the student contribution, and as well as a self-help or work expectation. Uh, and that work expectation, many of you might have seen it on your student's award letter as federal work study, student employment, or summer work expectation, that is the expectation of the student that they'll be contributing something towards their overall educational cost. And then whatever is left is what we call demonstrated financial need. And that is what we try to meet uh, with the UChicago grant uh, program. We try to meet 100% of that. So uh, students that have exceptionally high need, we're gonna meet 100% of that dedicated financial need. Uh, of course, less those contributions. Uh, for the student contribution, Generally, it's almost non-existent. Um, if a student has something in the way of a savings account or uh, investments of their own, if it's a sizable amount, we might look at that. But if it's, you know, if, you, if your student listed that they have $600 in their checking account, we're not factoring that in to the overall uh, you know, student uh, contribution. Parent contribution, obviously that could cover a little bit more. Parents, since many of you, I'm sure, are being extremely generous and helping cover your students' educational costs, uh, we are looking at the amounts uh, of funds that you have to draw on, but like the FAFSA, we're not looking at like retirement assets, just things that are liquid in nature. So I know I mentioned that we don't award loans, but there are loans available to students. Uh, so when I talked about that parental or student cost uh, or expectation, uh, that can be covered through loans as an alternative to paying it directly out of pocket or having that, you know, that little bit of a, a gap there out of pocket. Uh, students can borrow as a first year student up to $5,500 in Stafford loans and these are through the federal government. Uh, they're guaranteed to get them no matter what, they just have to go through the application process. It includes two steps, one is called entrance counseling so they know what their rights and responsibilities are and then the second step is uh, completing something called a loan agreement or master promissory note. Uh, parents, you can also borrow something called a Parent PLUS loan up to the remaining cost of attendance. And what that means is if your parent expectation or overall out of pocket uh, that you didn't want to just make a direct cash payment or sign up for a payment plan, you can actually borrow a Parent PLUS loan uh, to cover any direct costs and a little bit extra cover those indirect costs we talked about. So if you wanted to borrow an overage of uh, what you might have to pay to the institution directly, you would get that refunded to you and you could use that to cover those books, personal miscellaneous expenses. Uh, and such. Um, they both have their own separate dedicated interest rate. Uh, it's determined by the federal government and unfortunately they also have processing fees that are taken out by the federal government. Uh, those origination fees are more or less taken out of every parent and student loan that's being borrowed to help cover any student that might default. 
Um, you might notice there's a little bit uh, difference in the wave origination fees. Um, who's familiar with, the, uh, with sequestration? Nobody? Okay, a few years ago, the federal government really couldn't pay their bills, so they instituted a program called sequestration, essentially meaning that uh, certain federal programs were subject to either cuts or changes. Essentially, what that means is those origination fees are subject to change after October 1st of every year. Due to the fact that we're a little unique and our courses don't really start until the end of September, it's kind of like right up on that. So if you or your student borrow uh, anything in the way of loans on or before 10-1, they have the 1.069 and 4.264 or 0.276 fee. If it's after that, it's a slightly different fee. Um, what you're seeing in the way of borrowing really isn't noticed so much as what we are processing on the back end. So if you do want to borrow a student loan, you still can borrow it at any point throughout the school year. Uh, it's just a good idea just to get, probably get it done a little early if you want. Um, so our renewal process. So everybody just went through the whole application process. You got your kid applied. Your kid got accepted to here. Yay. They're in. Great. You're done. Well, October 1st, the FAFSA is available again. Um, you can complete it uh, using 2016 tax data. Um, it's a prior, prior tax system now for every year moving forward, both with the federal government and uh, our institutions. So we're always going to be asking for data from two years previously. Um, once that application begins, you'll probably receive notice from our office, or your students will. Federal government will also email out uh, students and parents, reminding them that the application is available. Um, the uh, second step is submitting any required documentation that we might ask for, uh, which we'll touch on in a second. Um, that documentation, generally, uh, we start asking for that around January, February. And including in that is uh, a few things. Uh, one is the U Chicago Financial Aid Worksheet. So a lot of you may have done that through your own admissions application. Uh, when you become a returning student, it's actually going to be available through the U Chicago portal. Uh, your student will receive notification that it is out there. Um, they can complete that. It's about 10 questions, so it's very simple. Um, if anyone has done a CSS profile, uh, that is optional. You can do it again for next year if you like. Um, we recommend the UChicago application for two reasons. One, it's considerably shorter, and two, it is free to complete. Um, if you still want to do a CSS or have done one, we'll still take it. That's fine, but we encourage you to use the free application. Um, then obviously the 1819 FAFSA and then submission of parent 2016 tax and W-2 information. Um, if you have uh, a lengthy tax return, uh, we do encourage you to submit the entirety of the return just so we don't have to go back and ask for any additional documentation. As I'm sure you're familiar through the application process, we did ask for quite a bit of information uh, both uh, through the FAFSA, the UC app, and the tax documentation. But we do use that to try to make the best financial aid determination available to get your student the absolute maximum amount of institutional-based grant that they can get. Um, we may ask for some additional documentation on a case-by-case -case basis, um, sometimes clarification for the taxes. Other instances, we might ask for documentation for federal aid purposes uh, just to get all that stuff taken care of. Um, there are some special considerations that we do make. Um, one is if a student is living off campus, it does affect that cost of attendance we talked about. So the cost of attendance for an on-campus student is roughly around $15,000 per year. If they move off campus, uh, we do consider off campus a little bit more affordable, so it does have an impact on their cost of attendance. Uh, but two things happen. One is that no longer becomes a direct cost. So if they're going to move off campus and get an apartment with some of their friends, they're not being billed that directly by the institution. So it could re result in um, you know, that cost of attendance adjustment, but it's something less than they have to pay to the school. Um, the other thing it would uh, affect is the amount of aid that they might receive. We do make an a, uh, allotment for a cost of attendance for an off-campus student. Um, it's around $3,500 less per year, so they would see a slight dip in what they're receiving institutionally, but their dollars can go further when they do live off campus, especially if they're living with roommates. They're spreading that cost out with rent, food, and so on. Um, two things to take into consideration with living off campus, and this is something more for when they're generally third or fourth years, typically juniors and seniors tend to live off campus, is that the uh, aid that they're going to receive is over the course of nine months, but odds are they'll probably be signing up for a year-long rental or lease agreement. So do uh, you know, remember or have your students remember that there might be a couple months there where they need to set some additional funds aside to cover those months where they're actually not going to be in session but still uh, you know, renting or leasing. 
Um, we do make allotments for study abroad. Uh, I believe more than 50% of U Chicago students actually do abroad programs. Uh, it's very popular. Uh, students are not required to do study abroad, but we highly encourage them to do study abroad. Um, if they are worried or they think to themselves, well, I don't really know if I can do study abroad or I really don't know if I can afford to do study abroad, definitely have them follow up with the study abroad office. Um, in addition to the regular financial aid that we do provide students, there are some scholarship opportunities for abroad programs. So um, they want every student that wants to do study abroad the ability to actually do it. And they don't want finances to be a barrier to that. So if any of your students are encouraged or interested in doing uh, abroad programs, we encourage them to follow up both with our office and the study abroad office. Um, we do make a cost of attendance adjustment when they're abroad uh, for whatever their program course costs uh, might be. Uh, there's two things we don't cover, unfortunately, for the abroad program. One is every abroad program has a program registration fee. I believe this year was around $650. We don't make an allotment for that, nor would we make an allotment for travel to wherever their abroad program is. Uh, so if they're going to be doing uh, airfare or um, if they're going to be doing an abroad program in Canada and want to drive, they could do that, but we wouldn't make travel uh, allotment. That said, we do an abroad adjustment for the program itself. Generally, the cost of residing at whatever other institution they might be traveling to and some minor board adjustments. Um, again, if they have questions about abroad, reach out to our office or the study abroad office. They are uh, well resourced and, and there's a large variety of programs that they can take advantage of. Uh, there's also internal special circumstances that we can take into consideration. Um, obviously, your student is going to be here for at least four years uh, and things can change from year to year. Um, you know, God forbid there is any subsequent uh, change in jobs, loss of income, uh, medical, unforeseen medical costs. Those are things that we can take into consideration. Uh, we would encourage you or your student to reach out to our office. Uh, for example, one of the things up here is financial burdens due to natural disasters. Obviously, with the impact of the recent hurricanes, there's families that have felt the effect of that. Uh, those are things that we can look at. Um, obviously, you know, I mentioned we're using the 2015 returns for this current year. Well, that's two-year-old data, and I'm sure many of you might have said, well, my financial situation two years ago really isn't reflective of where I'm at now or going to be moving forward. If that's the case, please do reach out to our office. And you can reach out at any point throughout this year if, again, God forbid, there's a job loss or some other major financial burden placed on your family. Please do contact us. Uh, we want to talk to you about that and see what we can do. Um, Student employment, uh, every student would have on their financial aid determination either just standard student employment or federal work study. Uh, that is kind of the student's portion of their, uh, you know, their financial commitment to help funding their own education. Um, if they're interested in, in doing student employment or federal work study, if they go to studentemployment.uchicago.edu and select undergraduate, it'll bring up the uh, UChicago uh, handshake site, which is a site that they can sign up for to help look for jobs on campus. Uh, federal work study positions, uh, obviously if your student has federal work study on there, that's a little bit more beneficial to them just due to the fact that a lot of departments want to have federal work study students. Uh, it might allow them a little bit better selection of jobs. But if they're not federal work study eligible, don't fret. They can still get regular standard student employment opportunities. Um, students, when they do uh, federal work study or student employment, they do receive a biweekly paycheck and they can use that for whatever they want to cover any of those indirect costs they have. If they want to turn around, pay it back to cover any portion of their tuition they might have, buy you guys some nice stuff from the U Chicago bookstore and mail it to you, thanking them for covering their costs while they're here, uh, they, can, they can use those funds for, for what they need, uh, need for. Uh, and again, on that site is the job postings. Uh, um, there is, of course, the Career Advancement Resource Center. Uh, I know I talked a little bit about uh, the Career Center earlier. Uh, they do have resume, cover letter writing, interview, uh, support, things of that nature. Um, I encourage everybody here to hassle your students to take advantage of all of the extra amenities and things that frankly they're paying for while they're going here to UChicago. So I know a lot of times students might say, well I'll go visit the Career Advancement Office when I'm getting ready to uh, be a senior. If anything, they should get on it early. If, uh, if they have the opportunity to go and do it now, uh, it'll be less stuff that they have to worry about later on. Um, if they do want to do student employment, they do obviously have some kinds of federal uh, and state uh, documentation they need to complete. Um, if they're work study, there is a federal work study authorization form, uh, and then of course an I-9 form. If they are going to be applying for a job here, I do believe we do require obviously a copy of an ID and their original SSN card. So if, if you as parents have your student's social security card 
uh, buried or locked up or uh, set aside for them thinking, well, I'm going to keep this because I don't trust them with it. Now's the time to break that out because I do believe they do need to have that original copy uh, to begin to do uh, student employment. Um, and then later on uh, this week, we're actually going to have, uh, or there's actually going to be a student employment and federal work study information session in Illinois. Uh, so this is for students to attend. It, it'll be in the cinema in that building. So if your students have questions about doing federal work study, doing student employment, uh, we you know, obviously encourage them to go to that uh, and ask any questions they might have. Um, very briefly, does anyone have any financial aid related questions I can help answer? Uh, there will be an open question session at the end as well. Yes, sir? Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna actually turn things over and we'll be uh, open up for more questions afterwards, either in here or out in the lobby if anybody has them. Uh, to uh, my coworker, Phyllis, from the Bursar's office. Thank you, Chad. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate that you came out on a Sunday, although you really didn't have a lot of choice, I understand. You're dropping <laughs> off your children. Um, so I'm going to talk about the billing office, what we do, and how we're here to serve you and your students. So in the Bursar's office, what we do is we co-manage your student's account. We, we like to think of it as a partnership between us, you, and your students. And what that is involved is largely trying to get student accounts to the middle ground. So we would like for balances to be zero, right? So part of that process is by creating an electronic bill, which students have access to automatically. What they should be doing is authorizing you to also have access to that electronic bill through the authorized payer process. How many of you are authorized payers now? Okay, quite a few, excellent, excellent. So we'll talk more about that later and how your child can make you an authorized payer. We also um, are responsible for e-payments. So we process all types of payments that you submit, whether those are online payments or checks, wires, et cetera. Um, we do have a third-party billing uh, contract process, which a few college students get involved in. Largely, um, there's a college pre-savings plan. There's Florida, Texas, and College Illinois. So aside from that, we don't really see um, the need for, or the, the requirement for this type of payment method. Um, but if you have questions about it, you can always ask us. Financial aid refunds. We um, also um, provide the 1098T tax document. That document is uh, used by parents, generally, when they're filing their federal income tax return to determine whether you qualify for a tax allowance. So how do you access your student's e-bill? Well, let me just start by saying that the students automatically get access to their bills through MyUChicago. So they log on to MyUChicago, the Finances tab, and then e-bill, e-pay, and in that same function, they can authorize you as a payer so that you too will receive notification of each electronic bill and you can also receive notification by text as well and the good news is that your children can authorize up to 10 people to have access to the e-bill and e-pay so if you have other family members that want to help you pay for their education have them sign those people up Okay, so I want to apologize about this screenshot. I didn't notice it prior to now. But if you look over on the left where you have this menu and it's all blank, um, those are just different services that we list there, like students. So for you, that's the big one. And it's going to be that fourth one down. And it will actually say students. So you won't have to remember that it's the fourth one down. But this will lead you to managing your student account. So managing your student account essentially involves making sure that you understand what all of the charges are, make sure that all the financial aid, all the resources are listed there. And you can do this by being an authorized payer. So your child will click on how to, 
how to enroll authorized payers, there's a guide, a step-by-step -step guide that gives them specific instructions to authorize you. And there's also on that same page a web link that is the authorized payer site as well. Um, so what charges are included on your bill? So I know that my colleague Thad talked about direct versus indirect costs. The majority of them are direct costs. Uh, tuition, mandatory fees, which are the student life fee, and for first year students, the college class fee, as well as the UPASS fee. Room and board for first year students because they're all required to live in housing. And as Thaddeus explained, in subsequent years, if your child moves off campus, then those charges will drop off and they will still be costs. You'll still be billed, but not by us. Um, health insurance. I want to take a few minutes to talk about health insurance because that is always a, to a hot topic because families often don't know how to go about waiving health insurance. So, and you might not want to waive health insurance. So either way, what you should do is waive or confirm your enrollment in that um, service that's our, our, our um, charge that's offered by the university. The deadline to waive is October 13th, 2017 at noon, and that is a hard and fast deadline. So if your child, for whatever reason, does not waive out of that cost, you will be billed for health insurance all three quarters. And that's not an insignificant cost. It's close to $4,000. But it, it, like I said, it is a hard and fast deadline. So if you know you meet the waiver requirements, go ahead and waive out of that cost as soon as possible. So what are your resources? Well, those can be made of many different, different things. Financial aid, which you've heard about. Loans, student loans, parent loans. 529 payments, other payments. One of that would, one of the, um, an example of that would be half of the $500 deposit that you paid. You'll see a $250 credit on the bill. The other half was retained for administrative costs associated with admissions. Um, and here is a bill sample. So I want to apologize up front because this bill has three different addresses on it. How many of you noticed that? And okay. okay, so there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we relocated our office this past December, and so in the upper left, it reflects our old address. Right below the dotted line is our current address, the 6030 South Ellis Avenue. That's where all paper check payments should be mailed. Now, on the bottom of this bill, there's also a bill stub, and there's a different address there, 75 Remittance Drive. That is a good address. That is our lockbox, our bank. So if you mailed it to that address, we will get that payment. We will also get it if you mailed it to our old address because all of, those, all of that mail is being forwarded to us as well. So we apologize for any confusion, but rest assured we will receive those payments regardless of which address it was sent to. So over in the upper right, we provide you with a summary. And that summary is derived from these major sections here, where we itemize charges for you. Tuition, mandatory fees, room and board, health insurance, either because you want to confirm enrollment in health insurance, or because you have not yet waived out of that charge. If you have waived out of health insurance since this bill was generated, you can go ahead and subtract that cost from the amount due. In addition, below we have all of the pending aid, which is, uh, you'll notice a, a difference in the dates from the charges and the dates for the aid. And that is because there are many federal um, rules and regulations that dictate when financial aid can be dispersed, that, dis that aid should have dispersed this Friday. So when you're looking at the current balance versus the bill, always keep in mind that the pending aid should be subtracted from the charges due. And down at the bottom, you see what is due from you. 
And let me back up one more time and mention that because we are in a quarter system, we do bill you three times, autumn, winter, spring. So this amount here is what you would expect in the winter as well as the spring. So how do I know what the total due is? Just uh, referring back to the prior screen, what we do is we total up all of your charges, then we total up all of your resources, subtract the resources from the charges, and the difference is the amount due. So what are your payment options? We have a few different payment options. Um, E-bill, e-pay is by far the most utilized payment method because it um, does away with the delays with mailing uh, paper checks and it's just very convenient. So if your child has not yet authorized you as a payer, make sure they do that and you can go online and look at the bill and make electronic payments there. So the monthly payment plan is also an option. This allows you to defer the quarterly amounts due over 10 months. If you have not enrolled yet and you think that you'd like to, you still have time. The deadline to do so is October 15th. There is a $90 enrollment fee associated with enrollment in the plan and the first month's payment is due upon enrollment and every payment thereafter will be due on the first of the month. So if you enroll after October 1st, you will be expected to make the first and the second payments at that time. So other types of payment options, which you've heard about already, financial aid and loans, as well as third-party sponsorship, which as we discussed uh, is, is rare for undergraduates, but if you have a situation, feel free to call us and we can talk in more uh, detail about that and how that works. Okay, and, and this goes along with the third party. Um, we just require a third party contract and again that information is provided online. Feel free to call us, email us, visit us. We love having visitors so if you're in the neighborhood feel free to stop by. Um, and again these are the, the bill will show you when the bill is due and also you can see those dates here. They're also posted on our website. Refunds, so you, you might wonder, well, how or why would I be eligible for a refund? Well, that situation will occur if the total of your resources is greater than the total of your direct charges. And some situations where that occurs is when you might have your students borrowing a loan or a parent is borrowing a plus loan or maybe the 529 payments caused a, a credit balance on the account. So the way that we would refund depends on what caused that overpayment. So if it was the student loan that caused the overpayment or a 529 check, we're gonna issue that refund to the student. And we would highly encourage you to have your child enroll in direct deposit because they will receive those funds much faster than they will if we mail a paper check. The difference is two to three business days for direct deposit versus five, sometimes 10 business days for a paper check. If it's a parent plus loan causing the overpayment, then we are going to mail a paper check to the parent who's borrowing the loan and the address to which it will be sent is the address that you indicated when you applied for the Parent PLUS loan online at studentloans.gov. If you want the refund that is caused by the Parent PLUS loan to be issued to your child, you should have answered yes when you applied for the loan because that question was presented. If you didn't do so and you've changed your mind since then, just reach out to us and we, we can make that happen. And we can issue that refund to the student instead. This is where students enroll through direct deposit through their MyU Chicago. They do many, many things through MyU Chicago. In addition to enrolling in that, that's where they will also go to authorize you as a payer. So other services that we do, we provide annual tuition rates for the entire university. If you're interested in seeing other than the college, you can see tuition rates for all the different graduate programs there as well. We provide the 1098T tax um, documents in early January. And this upcoming week, we will also be doing presentations for your students 
which will largely talk about the same things we talked about here today. If you want to have your child be more informed about billing and payment options as well. Um, there will be two of those sessions back to back. And we, um, let me mention that we'll be presenting with a bank representative as well who will just be there to speak in general terms, not promoting any bank or credit cards, but they will talk about how to manage a checking savings account, debit cards, whether they need paper checks or not. And they will talk about credit cards and the pros and cons of that. But you should feel free to have those discussions about credit cards with your children yourselves. Um, but we do talk about that with them so that they're well informed. At the same time these sessions are going on, the Financial Aid Office will also be holding sessions, two sessions back to back at the same time. So if you want your children to come to one of our sessions first, then they can go to the financial aid session next or vice versa. And then lastly, I would just add that we are constantly innovating, making changes to our systems and our processes, trying to make improvements and a better customer service environment for you. So I would encourage you to regularly visit our website so that you can stay up to date on those innovations. And you can do that at bursar.uchicago.edu. And this is our address, uh, telephone number, our email address. We don't require appointments. So if you're local or if you're here visiting the great city of Chicago, Hyde Park, feel free to drop by. We love to have visitors. And feel free to call us, email us anytime. So that will conclude my portion of the session, but we will remain for any questions that you might have about financial aid and billing.